one, anything's possible. Yeah. Um, two, no is just an opinion. <laughs> and, if you don't, and, and if you don't ask, you're not going to get. Welcome to the Get Invested podcast, where we share great conversations with experts from all walks of life to uncover their secret know-how and where they invest their time, their skills, and their money and the benefits that this has created. You see, the truth is that everyone invests. Every minute of every day, we're investing our time, our skills, our energy, and our money in something. Some of us are investing consciously, some unconsciously, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, and sometimes for no impact. Get Invested will help you to start living by design, not by default. I'm going to help you to make it happen, not let it happen. You'll hear the top tips on how you can live with conscious intent so that you can live more, work less, and leave a living legacy by investing now. Listen to the show to discover the top tips on how to get started, make the most of your investment journey, and ultimately to be living your dream, not someone else's. More episodes can be found on iTunes or at bushymartin.com.au forward slash invested. Thanks for listening, and now, let's get invested. Today I'm going to open with a question for you. What's your big why? Your why is the purpose, the cause, or the belief that drives you. Why do you exist? Why do you get out of bed every morning? Why should anyone care? Your why should make you cry. It should be emotionally engaging and compelling enough to keep you striving to achieve it without being sidetracked so that it acts as both a strong magnet to keep you attracted to it but also a compass to enable you to make decisions based on whether something's taking you closer to or further away from achieving your why. Your why is what sets you apart from everyone else. It's what inspires you to take action. And your why also inspires others to take action and to spread your ideas. So let me quickly ask again. Do you know what your big why is? And what are you doing about it? If you don't, you need to start asking yourself why you do what you do until you get to the real answers. And just keep asking why until there's no more whys to give. Let me give you a quick example. Our why, the big why of Sonia and I and the Know How Property Finance team, is to create happy homes. Pretty simple. Happy homes for all, particularly the voiceless and the innocent. You see, happy homes lead to happy lives that result in happy communities. And we do this by creating golden smiles. What does all that mean? Well, we start by giving you a golden smile by helping you to enjoy home ownership. We then help you enjoy a bigger golden smile by creating life ownership, and we do this through property investment so that you can live more, work less, and live your legacy by replacing your work income with passive recurring income. I talk about all of this in my book, The Freedom Formula. Now, by achieving this together, we fuel and fund our greatest golden smile, which is the charity that we'll be establishing to do all this. Because we want to be able to give generously to create a happy community by bringing together voiceless and innocent abandoned dogs with the forgotten old and lonely in our community in happy forever homes during the golden years. We strongly believe that this will help eliminate abandoned pet euthanasia and give much needed companionship and hope to the forgotten old elderly in our community. That's our big why. And we achieve all of this through our what and our how. You see, we're your property partners for home loans, investment strategy, and enabling property portfolios. Sounds pretty boring when you say it like that. But when you realise what it's achieving through our why, it suddenly takes on a much more motivating passion. So I'll ask you quickly again, what's your big why? And as importantly, what are you doing about it? Today's guest is another shining example of someone who's driven to massive action by his big why. Let me explain. His godson suffered a form of epilepsy which resulted in recurrent severe damaging seizures and fits that could occur at any tick of the clock. His family used to kiss him every night when he went to bed and worry whether he'd still be alive in the morning. At the time, the family only had two options to deal with this debilitating and very life-threatening condition. It was either brain surgery 
or try and use prescribed doses of cannabis oil that has been scientifically proven to significantly reduce the severity and frequency of seizures and allow children to return to a more normal existence. Now, unfortunately, the second option was illegal in Australia at the time, so the family had no option but for their son to undergo major brain surgery. And the result? The poor boy is now permanently paralysed down one side of his body and he'll never be able to enjoy a normal active life like his father, who was a professional athlete. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, this is just a crazy situation where a proven medication taken from the non-hallucinatory component of cannabis has been denied due to old and outdated views on cannabis as a gateway drug. Now, this has spurred today's guest to establish WECAN, that's W-E-C-A-N-N, a company devoted to the development of a safe, sustainable and world-leading medicinal cannabis industry based right here in good old Adelaide, South Australia. He wants to do this so that future epileptics, cancer patients and the elderly and others can access natural quality relief without resorting to aggressive surgeries or other treatments that seem to create as many side effects as they cure. Now, he's a man on a mission to heal thousands and change lives and his big why is big enough to demolish mountains of prejudice, change attitudes and re-educate a generation. But he's also the same man whose childhood love of basketball led him to become the CEO of the dead and almost buried Adelaide 36's basketball team in the NFL back in the late 2000s that managed to put the team back on the map and is still running successfully today. In his words, he's what he calls a professional dot joiner. He's able to see big picture opportunities where others can't and then to bring them to fruition. I'm talking about the local humble hero and motivated maverick, Ben Fitzsimmons. So how's he able to invest so much time, energy, money in his big wires and his driving passions? Very simply, because he's got time on his hands. How? Because his income needs are looked after without relying on him to generate it. He doesn't work for money. He gets money to work for him. You see... Ben's a successful investor. And you may be interested to find that he started off just working in the Commonwealth Bank. But now he's in a position where he's got the time and the freedom to pursue and support his passions because his income needs have been met and his future is secure. And I've noticed something about Ben and others that have achieved the same sort of financial freedom. Firstly, they don't care what others think. They speak their mind and say exactly what they think. They don't need to impress anyone. They've got the time to contemplate what they really believe and also got the time and resources to do something about them. And they have a quiet confidence, a a can-do attitude, a long-term vision, plus a genuine belief and optimism in the future. Ben's the living epitome of all of these qualities and you'll hear it in the relaxed pace and the clarity of thought that's expressed in his voice. So what does Ben invest in? How does he do it? And how can you learn from him to live life on your own terms? Get ready to sit back and enjoy a very enlightening conversation with Ben Fitzsimmons. Freedom Fighters, it's Bushy Martin back on Get Invested. And today we've got the real pleasure to talk to someone who describes himself as a professional dot joiner. Now, uh, the mind bubbles when we think about that. Ben, uh, welcome aboard. I'm looking forward to having a great chat, mate. Cheers, Bushy. Appreciate it. Mate, uh, you're well known in Adelaide uh, circles and and elsewhere, but for those who don't know you, can you give us a bit of a rundown on uh, what you do and why you do it? Yeah, I guess... um what I what I do now, what I focus on now, is is um, property investment. So I guess you, you, you know, colour me as a property developer, um, which gives me my time to go off and do other interesting things. And one of those we're trying to play with at the moment is medical cannabis, and trying to get that in a in a format inside South Australia and Australia that will help lots of people. Um, Play around in professional sports and some other other different things. But property is my, my, 
I guess, my main passion and, and um, where I get my enjoyment from. Awesome, mate. Well, look, uh, we'll delve into a couple of those subjects later. And what I picked up on straight away where there was the fact that uh, property has probably given you the time and therefore the freedom to be able to pursue some of these other interests like uh, your interest in sport, cars and um, and the uh, cannabis industry. But before we jump into that, mate, what I'd love to do is get you to talk us through your history. And if we go way back... Uh, very yep. keen to g- just get you to walk us through the formative years, uh, you know, from a little bit of research I've done, uh, a bit of time in Adelaide, and then the the thrills and spills of Hamilton Island when you were growing up. So keen yeah. for you to talk us through all that, and uh, what impact did that have on you in terms of your values, your beliefs, and, be- and your behaviours, and where did that lead you to? Yeah. Can you walk us through that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I guess... Um, you know, things happen in life where when it happens to you, you think it's the worst thing in the world, but when you look backwards, it actually is a good thing in hindsight. So one of the things that happened to me early on in my life was my parents got divorced and through circumstance or fortune, my, my father ended up going to Hamilton Island because of his interest in motorsport. The guy that owned Hamilton Island uh, at the time was... Uh, a motorsport guy, a um, guy by the name of Keith Williams, who probably most famously for Australians built SeaWorld on the Gold Coast. He, he started that with his bare hands. Yep. And one of the things he got to do was Hamilton Island early, very early on. So we're talking you know, early 80s through to the late 80s um, in, in my life. Yep. And so Dad went up there to work for Keith and basically was the, the go-to man on, on the ground that made – all the decisions work, liaise between engineers, architects, and Keith himself about what his vision was and getting his vision out of his head and off the paper into reality. So as a kid, I'd go up there you know, as many times a year as possible in school holidays and bounce around in my dad's ute and go to all these meetings with engineers and architects and banks and accountants and, and uh, basically sit in the corner and not say anything but just instead of playing with pencils or whatever, iPads these days, just listen to what was going on. And then I guess sort of fast forward that into to my 20s, it sort of dawned on me that I had this amazing education about property development and hospitality and um, lots of different aspects of property development and a lot of that was I was exposed to from a very young age. So um, I started working at the Commonwealth Bank um, basically out of high school because I decided high school was where my education finished and all the successful people I'd met through Hamilton Island and, and uh, associated with most of those people either didn't finish high school or c- certainly didn't go on to um, university. Um, not that I'm saying that's the right choice for everyone, but I started analysing the people and trying to work out what success was and how come these people were able to have time off with their families months in the year while my dad ran around working. I tried to work out and tried to get that my brain to understand that and it just sort of came back to these people were people that controlled their own life, they controlled their own business, their own investments. Um, they weren't employees, which was the big takeaway. Um, and so I decided that going to university was only going to educate me on how to be a good employee, which is what I didn't want to do. <laughs> Yeah, I love um, that. I love that, mate. It's it's just, yeah, you're, you're, you're in control, right? So, yeah, um, yeah, it's a really interesting thing to think about, but um, because it's not what we're taught to believe in, um, I think that's probably a reason why I get to do what I do. Yeah, but, yeah. Let, let's let's yeah. let's dig into that a little bit, mate, because uh, I w- wouldn't mind you just painting a picture for us. Because when you mention Hamilton Island, uh, most people now think of the five star luxury. Uh, basically, re- resort that it is, but uh, yeah. back in the the day, and I'm guessing if it's back in the 80s, it was it was basically a a rock in the water. Uh, t- talk us yeah, through very, the very yeah, talk us through that transformation because I, I guess it sounds like your your old man was certainly someone who's able to take a vision and and turn it into reality. And obviously, there was built in almost. If I was looking for a description, is probably is probably a born project manager. Is that, is that what we're saying? 
Yeah, yeah, he was he was the construction manager, the the project manager, whatever you want to you know call that. Um, yeah. Um, and, and so what I got to see, I guess the, the easiest way to explain it is I've got a photo of myself standing on Cat's Eye Beach, which is the main beach on Hamilton Island, and there's not one building on the island. Yeah. Um, Saturday night I was out having some people, and the lady there was telling about how her family's just bought a a property on Hamilton Island, and so I was able to get out of my phone and show. Oh, Here's where you bought your property, and this is what it looked like before it was built. And uh, so I've got you know this amazing connection to that place, which you know, learnt about building harbors and airports and banks and bakeries and multi-storey accommodation, single-rise accommodation, water treatment plants, uh, all sorts of things that are all you know things that are built all, all around the world in every city. Hamilton Island became as you said, it was just a rock in the ocean and, and it's its own functioning city now. It's got its own power plant. It's got its own water facilities. It's got its own sewage treatment. It's got its own um, very shit. It's got, a, yeah, so it, it's got all this amazing infrastructure that were created in this little microcosm. So very lucky to see that place get developed and, and the brain power that goes behind the vision of, of making that happen, you know. Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, watching someone, you know, when when you see a harbour get built, there's two reasons why they build a harbour. One is they dig the hole to create the water, yep. and then they sell the water because you need that's where you put your boat, so that gets sold. <laughs> and then the dirt that they've pulled out of the harbour goes around the harbour, and that's where you b- sell the land to the people who want to buy their block of land to build their house to look at their boat in the water. So you build, you effectively dig a hole and sell it twice. Um, so from a property development a business point of view, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Yeah. Pretty formative age as well because uh, I guess almost by osmosis, you're sort of uh, picking all this up without even being aware that you're, you're uh, developing some skills and knowledge in, in that pretty uh, interesting yeah. area, mate. Uh, absolutely. I, I guess I sort of... Referred to it as my real education because that was that was reality. It wasn't you know books. It wasn't wasn't studying dead people. It was alive and happening and um, and real and tangible. You know, and you could you could see decisions that were made and what outcomes they had and why things why roads went where and why water pipes went where they did and all those sorts of things that you sort of. Um, understand why the world is we live in a little bit when you see what the decisions are that lead you to where you are, if that makes sense. Absolutely um, makes sense. Yeah, it does, mate. And I guess the the other parallel benefit of uh, spending so much time on Hallett Island is it was pretty much party town. When it got rocking and rolling, anyone who was anyone yeah. internationally would go through Hamilton Island, mate. So I guess yeah. you probably yeah. rub, rub shoulders with some in, pretty interesting people there. Can you share, yeah, yeah. share a bit of that with us? Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's... there's um, very lucky that you know some people became um, you know good friends and and continue to be this day. It's funny. We're, I went to the Grand Prix in Singapore a couple of years ago, and I was walking out of the hotel with my wife, and I saw Sir Jackie Stewart getting out of a, a taxi at the hotel, and I just said to my wife, "Watch this." <laughs> and uh, I went up to Sir Jackie and said, "Hi, Jackie. You might not remember me, but..." You and my father on Hamilton Island you used to hang out a bit. And he went, Hamilton Island? And he said, your dad's John. Yes. All oh, right. And then we had this amazing conversation for half an hour, which, you know, rattled off some world-famous household names amongst the, in the conversation. Well, how's so-and-so and how's this and how's that? And we, we, we left him and my wife said, all those stories you tell me are true. Like, yeah, they are. <laughs> you know, so, you know, whether it's a beetle, whether it's, you know, my dad had a, had a birthday party at his house once. He's born on Australia Day, so it ended up being quite the party for the, for the island and all the all the, the staff. And yeah. I remember leaning to my left and asking this lady who I didn't recognise from anywhere around, you know, who she was, and she came back, well, I'm the Queen of Denmark. <laughs> oh, right. And this is literally on the, on the back deck of my dad's house having a barbecue. <laughs> oh, right, okay. So it just yeah, bizarre stories like that where, yeah. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned the Beatle, mate. Uh, given George yeah. Harrison was a bit of a, a cars man, I'm guessing that's probably who we're talking about, are we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so George ended up buying a, a house on, on Hamilton Island and um, 
Yeah, whenever he'd come to Adelaide, I'd get the phone call from the from the man, and we'd go to the races together and hang out, and um, which is looking back kind of bizarre because I'm a teenager getting phone calls from someone like that saying, "I need you to come hang out with me because I don't want to be there by myself." And uh, yeah, yeah, just one of, one of those amazing people in life who was an icon. But I, I wish I, I knew what I knew now, so I could have far better conversations with him than. What I did have at the time. But, well, mind yeah. you, that the the fact that you didn't know that and just treated him like another human was part, probably part of the attraction for him too, Matt. I'm guessing. Oh yeah, we just talked cars and talked, you know, Grand Prix drivers and and uh, movies and you know, one of my favourite movies is Life of Brian and and uh, little did I know he actually paid for Life of Brian to be made. And yeah, he, he thought. Yeah. Quite good that I enjoyed that movie. So, um, and, I, and I only found that you know years later that he actually paid for the whole movie to be made and, and was happened to be in it as well. Yeah, um, so yeah. Just like that, it's kind of it. Kind of I knew who he was, obviously, but it was oblivious to me the weight of who he was and yeah. what he'd achieved in life. But I, yeah. I guess the I'm mean, I'm just talking out loud here, Ben, but. Uh, I'm imagining, though, that sort of taking in a stride and just rubbing shoulders with people because they're people without the hero tag. Uh, moving forward, has that been useful to you in terms of just having no fear of asking anyone any question at any time? Cause, yeah, uh, 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Just, they're just a human being at the end of the day. Yeah. You know, whether they've got a name attached to them, whether they've got, you know, millions of followers on social media, whether they're someone that's in the news every day, whether it, it doesn't matter, you know, like there, there's, at the end of the day, we're all, we're all the same. We enjoy the same things. We enjoy being with our friends. Most of us enjoy being with our family and we enjoy life, you know, like, you know, look for good times and having fun and, and that's, that's commonality amongst us all. Yeah. Um, just because someone's got a different numbers in their bank account compared to someone else doesn't make them better or worse, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, there's that great saying, mate, that uh, I've, I've actually quoted in a chapter of the book I've written on the, on the subject that your network equals your net worth. And given the, the sort of people that you had an opportunity to spend time with early on, has, has that uh, influenced you at all in relation to where you went and what, what you're doing now? I think so. I think so because it's sort of bred in me, I guess, that um, anything is, a ch- one, anything's possible. Yeah. Um, two, no is just an opinion. <laughs> and, if you don't, and, and if you don't ask, you're not going to get. So, um, you know, like, it, it's it's amazing, you know. The, the, I think I sort of have this feeling that people genuinely want to help people out and, if, if you're a person who's got influence, then there's no greater way to show off you've got influence than using your influence. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, so people, people who've got influence will want to help people because they want to demonstrate their influence. It's just a simplistic human trait, you know? Yeah. It's like, um, like a volume switch, isn't it? It's, it? It gives you the ability to do things that uh, you otherwise wouldn't. So, yeah. And that can be used for good and bad, but if you've got a, a, a good bet, yeah. then you can, you can do some awesome stuff with it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, awesome, mate. Okay, well, look, um, let's, let's, uh, let's continue down the journey then because uh, I, I want to sort of dig into the property piece now because you, you jumped into Commonwealth Bank and soon realised yep. that uh, being a, an ant on the conveyor belt probably wasn't your thing, uh, particularly given yeah. the freedom that you'd seen your father and everyone else that you'd been uh, dealing with over those years. Uh, what what was your first uh, step then? Uh, what, what did you invest in initially and where did that take you to, mate? Well, I guess, I guess the first sort of aha moment where, you know, I'd kind of forgotten I'd had this education growing up and got in, you know, got in the the trap of go and get a job because, you know, you get promoted and then you earn more money and then you get promoted and you earn more money. And I sort of fell into that um, for a portion of time. I just remember being at a branch here in Adelaide. There's a low socioeconomic area called Elizabeth. And um, just talking to the loans officer at the branch there and seeing these people that were coming in buying houses in Elizabeth, three-bedroom houses on 800, 900 square metres of land. And back then, they were buying these things for forty-five, fifty thousand dollars. Good grief! 
And I started I did that. Oh, I earned forty grand a year. I could you know, I could live out here on a year's salary. That's pretty amazing. And then I started looking at what the rents these things were getting. And, you know, I'm on forty grand a year, so that's about a hundred bucks a week. Yeah. And these things are bringing in hundred and thirty, hundred and fifty dollars a week in rent. Gosh. And I start doing the maths in my head, go, okay, so fifty grand at five percent, right oh. Um, it's 150 bucks a week rent. Take off this. Today. Okay, I need to get like eight of these things, and I've replaced my wage. Yeah, I don't have to work anymore. Yeah. So my first my first uh, foray into into property was was Elizabeth. So you know, bought as many as I could with the financing. That was available to me. Pretty, pretty and, uh, good in those days. I, again, just to put the picture around this, it was almost 100% borrowings at that stage. I, I remember myself uh, getting properties where we get not, I could borrow 97% plus more yeah, insurance. Oh, yeah, yeah. So yep. it, it, yep. is that the sort of era we're talking about, mate? Yeah, 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 100%. So, so basically I had to come up with a stamp duty, which was, you know, so your closing costs were about 6%. So on a $50,000 property, about three grand. Yep. And then you had to come up with the, exactly right, the one and a half percent between, well, sorry, the three percent between the bank, what the bank wouldn't give you, and your mortgage. Yeah. So, you know, for for five grand, yeah. thereabouts, you're, you're buying a fifty thousand dollar property that's got about a hundred bucks a week net cash flow attached to it. Yeah. So, five grand return in the year one on your five grand outlay. Not bad. It's a no-brainer. So, uh, so you collected a bunch of these. Take us on the journey there, mate. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Where that so, took you so from. started collecting these things and was buying them as fast as I could find them, buying them as fast as I could finance them. Yep. And then what started happening is the, the pricing moved out there. The rents sort of stabilised around the 150 But what was a $50,000 house was, you know, slowly jumped up to eighty, eighty-five thousand dollars $85,000 house. Yep. And I'm 23 years of age, right? <laughs> so I've got, I think it was about six of them at the time. Yep. And I go, right, I've got 30 grand equity in each one of these. Yep. Six lots of 30 grand, that's a lot of money. <laughs> I could really go and have some fun with that. <laughs> so I sold them all, sold them all, bought, bought the Lotus sports car um, <laughs> and thought I was an absolute rock star um, because – Look at me, how good am I? I'm 23, 24 years of age, driving around a $50,000 car. Um, <laughs> and years later, you realise what a mistake that was. But, you know, I wouldn't be here if I didn't make that mistake. So yeah. um, basically took that, took the, 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 the bit that I didn't spend and, and um, started getting into renovating properties because I thought, you know, you watch the block and yeah. all these shows where they show you how easy it is to make all this money by renovating a house. And I thought, oh, yeah, that. I reckon I could do that. <laughs> so go and do that, and then you realise these TV shows don't factor in one important cost in all their renovation costs, and that's the actual cost of the labour yep. or the time cost or the interest cost. Or the, cap- um, or the capital or that- gains tax if you sell it within 12 months. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Or, or the capital gains tax, or the agents fee, or the marketing costs. Or all that. So on paper you do your maths as a young kid and go, wow, well, I'm going to make 50 grand if I do this, you know? And then you walk out of there with about 900 bucks profit and you're like, hang on, Dad, what happened here? So, you know, learn, learn, <laughs> learn that and then then sort of started looking at, this is probably, you know, uh, early 2000s we're talking, um, started looking at um, buy one, knock it over, put two on it. And the strategy then was to take all the profit from the one you sell and keep the second one. Yep. And rent it out. Yep. Um, and that was the strategy and that worked quite well until I went, wow, look at all the money I've got sitting in these things. I could sell them and be a really cool guy. <laughs> what, what did you buy this so, time, mate? You bought the Lotus the first uh, time. What was the oh, no, no, second I, I time around? Uh, well, I, I, bought a, uh, I, bought a, you know, I bought a fairly decent house in a fairly high-priced suburb in Adelaide and had all the parties and all the people living in the house and I was the cool guy that owned the house that hosted the parties and <laughs> everyone was my mate. And uh, it was fun times, right? You know, it's what, you know, young single guy with a bit of money in his pocket thought I was, you know, thought I could do anything, indestructible. Yep. And then, so you just keep doing that for a bit and then 
um, took on more and more debt and started to probably get a bit stressed oh. uh, at that because what I was what I found myself doing was selling off my cash flow producing properties and got sort of trapped or you know bedazzled by the highlights of the uh, you can make 200 300 grand here yeah but had no you know ended up slitting my own throat to some degree because I just got rid of all my cash flow yeah to service the debt so then I ended up having to burn two or three properties that I've accumulated that I wish I still owned yeah because that's what you end up doing. Um, yeah. And and just sort of refocused on my, you know, the early lessons are that cash flow is, cash flow is king, you know. Yeah. It's not cash, it's cash flow for me. Yeah. And got back into cash flow producing properties, which is, which is for me, is commercial. Um, okay. So yeah. you, making that jump then, so you'd you, you sort of, the, and I, I, I agree with you, the, I've made a heap of mistakes early on with the, the, the belief that, you know, buy, build, and sell was the way to go, and it just got just got burnt. It wasn't going anywhere, and and uh, soon learned that buy, build, and hold, and then just use equity and fold it over and and build the portfolio that way has been been uh, very generous to myself and my wife. Uh, we haven't yeah. gone down the commercial road because uh, there, there isn't the capital growth that that I've seen uh, in that. But uh, tell me more about your. your Entry into that space because you might have some other views on that. Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, I didn't know how to do it. So, an agent I'd met through real estate land had gone and joined a local prominent commercial agency. Yep. And we sort of made a pact that we were going to work out how to do this because he was meeting all these uh, very successful developers, and they were doing this deal and that deal and making this and making that and and had all the income coming in and, you know, you go and do a deal with a tenant and they're paying 600 grand a year in rent yeah. on one deal, yeah. you know, all of a sudden that gets pretty intoxicating. You're like, okay, how do I get amongst this? Yeah. So we sat down every, every every Tuesday, the commercial section of the paper comes out, so we, we decided we were going to catch up every Tuesday, go through the paper and see if we could work out how these guys that were doing it were putting these deals together because we figured there was some secret source on what they were doing and, and arguably is, you know, it's probably, you know, not knowing what you don't know until you know it and you know <laughs> how to work it out. So basically got got to a point where we got enough knowledge together and watched enough deals be put together by third parties that we basically engineered deals backwards to ourselves until we found one that we did and that, that worked out really well. That worked out really well. So uh, what, what, sort of, what sort of commercial property, mate, can I ask? Uh, that one, that one was a gym. Okay. That one was a gym that, that bought, bought the privately owned gym, yep. leased it out to an international tenant. Yep. And, um, off we went. Okay. And where did that, we that roll on to, mate? So you started with the gym. Just, just talk me through yeah. it a little bit. If you can. So then, so that, so what, what happens in the commercial space is it's probably, you know, like like anything, agents go and fish where the fish are. So yeah. if you're out there doing deals, that means commission to an agent. If you're sitting on the sidelines not doing any deals, the agent's not probably going to call you and say, hey, I've got this or I need a tenant here or a, a building there or what whatnot. So yeah. you need to be doing deals because yeah. you're going to be standing in front of the money truck more often than not. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so if you don't do deals, you don't get the phone calls. You do deals, you get the phone calls. Yeah. Um, and so what that did was a bit of sort of, I guess, how do I phrase it? So I've sort of arrived on the scene, I guess. Yep. And then the phone starts ringing. So then you go on to the next one and it's all about the information for me, the commercial space. Um, so were you, that were you building um, the income streams so that you could then get them revalued to create a bit of extra equity to then fold that equity into the next one, mate? Was that pretty much the plan or not? Pretty, pretty much so fully funded. So yep. there was nothing to extract out of them. It was just purely building cash flow. Yep. Um, so, yeah, the more, the, the more cash positive it is, the better. So, yeah. And, and then what happens? You've got strength. So, you know, people see the paper, you've got tenants that fall over, whether they're, you know, listed companies or not. You know, sometimes receivers come in or, or bankruptcy happens and tenants fall over. So the more income you've got, more income streams you've got from across different tenants, the, the better you are. So if you do have a problem with one, it doesn't doesn't 
doesn't cripple you. You know, yeah. it's a, it hurts, but doesn't cripple you. So you got multiple um, streams. What, what about funding them, mate? Because you know most commercial funders will only look at sort of sixty, maybe seventy uh, percent. Yeah, that's funding. right. What, how but, are you covering but, the shortfall? So it's about demonstrating the value add. Okay. For me. Yeah. So so with it, like if you use in residential terms, which is probably the easiest way to to, to um, articulate it. If I've got a one site and I'm going to knock it over and put two on it, and let's say I'm going to pay. 500 for this derelict house to get the land, yep. but I've got two houses that are worth 600 each when, when they're finished yep. and they're going to cost me 300 grand each to build. I bought paid 500 for land, 600 build, 1.1, but they're worth 1.2 when they're finished. Yeah. Right? So I've demonstrate, I can demonstrate up front to the bank with a valuation yep. that the deal is actually a $1.2 million deal, not a $500,000 deal. Yeah, gotcha. Gotcha. So yeah. it's, it's, a, it's about demonstrating... The value add. Yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome, mate. So, you, and you're still doing that? Where, which fingers and which yeah. pies have you got now, mate? Is that predominantly where uh, you've got your energy? Yeah, very, very, very much so. Well, it's what you know, what what puts food on the table and what puts the the, the money in the bank account. You know, so have, um, you, have you shifted the tops of? Because I, I guess the uh, looking. Top down, uh, yep. a, a lot of commercial, particularly retail type spaces like your gyms and whatnot, they're, they're going to be under threat. They're a dime a dozen, uh, you know, getting anchor tenants that uh, are going to survive the distance uh, to make sure they continue to pay the rent. Uh, it yep. must be an ongoing challenge. How, how have you tackled that and what, how has that changed your strategy uh, in terms of what you're doing now and what you'll be doing in the future? Um, I guess I'm. Focus, my, my tenancies are mostly not focused on selling widget, yep. selling either service or food. Right. So whether it's health services or financial services or um, community-based services, um, not selling shoes, not selling dresses, yep. but things that people will buy, you know, not, not to be bold enough to say recession-proof, but... I think there's more um, more protection, um, more downside protection in, in industries or, or, or genres that aren't going to be, you know, discretionary spending stuff. You know? So it's what, what are you talking, petrol stations? Are we talking, put some colour yeah, in for us? Yeah, got, yep. got petrol stations, got um, uh, health, got food, got professional services. Yeah. Um, got government-based um, tenancies. Great. Um, yeah. So very, very few. Well, hardly any retail. Um, yeah. In that mix, but yeah. Um, it's not to say that I don't believe in it. It's just that that's just what I do. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you, you're playing the safe money, and and if it's government supported, then and and they're major major tenants that are not likely to be here today and gone tomorrow, and then you've diversified by having uh, multiple streams coming in, and that's a that's a pretty yeah. good way to build a a pretty safe and ongoing income stream, mate. That's bloody awesome. So, mate, uh, something that I've always said to people, uh, you know, a lot of Aussies are rich, but they're not wealthy, and what I mean by that is that there's a lot of Aussies that focus on income, but they don't fo- focus on the assets. And, you know, if you're, yep. you're only wealthy if you've got time on your hands, if you ask me. And the only way you're going to get time on your hands is if your income needs are being met elsewhere. And clearly, yep. you've done that very well through property. Uh, and having time on your hands and the income to support it uh, obviously gives you both uh, the latitude and probably also the courage to some degree to start having a crack at some things that uh, a lot of people who've got their head down and bum up in the trenches just don't even get a sniff at. Uh, let, let's yeah. delve now into some of the really interesting things that uh, you've continued to do, and we'll, we'll start with the uh, the Adelaide 36s. Uh, yeah. Talk us through yeah. that, mate, because uh, a, pre- a pretty gutsy move at the time, given uh, what was happening. Uh, f- for those who aren't aware of that story, can you just um, talk that through with us, please, mate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Um I'm a I'm a basketball guy, so my two my two sport passions are motorsport and basketball. Yeah. Um, and and I've been a big you know thirty sixes fan supporter, um, well wisher, 
um, for, for a long time. And um, the situation came up where the, the person that owned the, the team um, had lost their support, their financial support, their financial backer, and basically they were just going to close the doors and walk away. And that would have crippled not only the league, but, you know, maybe, well, not certainly, certainly the team in Adelaide, yeah. but also the, the league as well. So yeah. um, myself and a bunch of other people decided we liked it too much and we thought we'd get have a go at it. And so we put some money on the table and, and uh, you know, 10 years later, the team, the team's still here. The NBA was going from strength to strength and, um, you know, sort of think, well, had a little bit to do with that, but um, yeah, got involved in that. And my my, my top tip is uh, is don't get involved in professional sports. <laughs> um, it's it's funny. There's a there's a guy in the US, Mark Cuban, who's Shark Tank. He's one of the first tech com tech billionaire guys, and he owns a, a basketball team in the NBA. And a, yeah. a friend of mine messaged him and said, "My my mate's about to buy a basketball team in Australia. What what advice have you got for him?" Don't. And he just wrote. He wrote back, "Don't do it." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, what I love that, that what's that old saying? Uh, never mix uh, business and pleasure, uh, because yeah, the, that yeah, em- yeah. emotional attachment to the sport can get in the way of uh, what is really a business. And yeah, uh, uh, yeah, that's true. That's true, Bushy. But I remember being there with my kids. Um, about six months ago, I'm seeing them just the, the look on their face and how much enjoyment it brought them, and yeah. um, you know, having people that I I like um, that are friends that are involved in the sport still and yeah. playing what having them come around the house and shoot hoops in the backyard with the kids and all that sort of stuff. I think you know, yeah, it was worth it. Oh, it mate, it. you 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 saved an icon, yeah. mate. Uh, it was gone. At the time you got on board, and uh, yeah, but not you know, lots of good people, lots of good people were involved. I did my bit, but yeah, yeah, no, it's something to be yeah. very proud of, I think, mate. I just without going off on too much of a tangent, uh, because I've yeah. often thought this, uh, you, know, you, you look at all the sporting codes, as you know, they're all fighting for shelf life, uh, they're, they're yeah. grunty machines, they, they need a lot of coin to keep them turning over. Uh, yeah. What, what do you think the the future of uh, professional sport is in that context? Because uh, there aren't too many success stories. There, most of them are subsidised, aren't they? Oh, for, for sure, for sure. Well, I think you know, as as the world gets smaller, we're more you know contactable. Um, kids are growing up with iPads attached to them far too far too much. Yeah. Um, and it's something I raised with the federal sports minister. I'm like, you're, you're backing in sport like AFL, and I'm not an AFL guy, and you're probably going to pick that up in a minute, but <laughs> I look at international football and basketball and think, okay, we've got 300 million people that play basketball in China alone. There's 300 and something million people that play soccer around the planet. Yeah. Um, what, how, long, how much longer has the AFL got to last here before yeah. the kids going you know, every, every day, well, not every day, regularly, you see articles about how parents are pushing their kids towards soccer or, or basketball, um, and just, I just wonder what sort of long tail the AFL does have. So my, my you know, my thought is that basketball and soccer are going to be the future, and then you've got your esports as well, which are coming through like a powerhouse where kids are watching other kids play video games. Yeah, no, I agree with you, mate. Um, Absolutely agree with you. And the other thing I think that uh, if we, we look at the development of the sport, I heard Bomber Thompson talk here uh, 12 months ago where he said that uh, the AFL is not putting anything back into junior football. So the, 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 you know, the next generation of players uh, aren't going to be there. So you've, yeah. got, you've got the, the drop in the quality of the, of the gladiators on the, on the pitch and then you've got uh, you know, these massive threats uh, you know, you can watch pretty much any sport live uh, on your phone these days uh, from anywhere in the planet. So, you know, you've got these global heroes overshadowing what used to be local heroes. It's uh, going to be pretty challenging, I think. Yeah, and, and, and that's, the, that's the media landscape as well. I mean, you've got these global media players that have already paid for the rights to the Premier League or rights to the NBA. So they... They've already owned the, the content. 
they don't need to go and pay for anything else. They don't need to invest in anything else. So that's that's an easy, simple decision for them is to push that content through their network and that's what we'll end up seeing more and more of, I think. Yeah, you know? of course. Uh, and and the, other, the other sports will, screen time will, will evaporate. Mm, interesting days. Now, you, you only spent a couple of years there, mate. Uh, uh, yep. reason, reason for moving on? But talk to talk to us. Are you just a, a builder and not a maintainer, or talk yeah, talk yeah, to no, what no, you're no, thinking? No, I can't. The, I I felt like the patient survived, <laughs> and then it was up to someone else to gotcha to, to make you know keep it keep it alive. You know, so I moved on, went, and um, yeah, basically just got back into my property stuff. So. Yeah. Um, um, that's just one natural calling, and yeah, we're from my happy place, building things, putting it together, and I guess that plays to my character is that once you build a building and hand it over, you go find the next one. You don't have to worry about, yeah, you, know, you don't have to worry about maintaining it yeah. per se. As in, you don't have to be there every day or. Yeah. whatnot, you know, like it, it's just locked and loaded and off you go to the next one, so. Yeah, I agree, mate, and it's, I, I, I was a, an architect and a project manager for 17 years and the satisfaction you get out of creating something from nothing uh, yeah. and then it stands there, it'll, it'll, the, they'll still be there after you and I've gone and yeah. Uh, yeah. it's a great legacy and great physical satisfaction out of, out of making that happen. But the, the yeah. one, the one good thing about, and what I love about property for, for me is it's, it's given us time back. So, you know, I, I wouldn't have the, the privilege of being able to have a chat to you and have the time to do that if it wasn't for what property's done for us. Now, you, you had a crack at the, uh, the 36s. Uh, you spent a bit of time with the, yep. um, Shaheen family. Talk to us about that one, mate. I, I'm just interested in, yep. given the fact that you, you're probably well on the road uh, independently uh, financial at that point in time. What, what was the attraction to jump on board with the family business? I'm sort of uh, interested. So I met, met um, Dr. Sam through basketball, big 36ers fan, so we, we ended up becoming quite friendly and have a passion for motorsport, which is yep. he sort of unleashed his passion a bit larger than uh, anyone else has in Australia most recently, spending 100 and Something million dollars out at Tail and Bend, Bend, building the second, just the great yeah. race track in the world. Yeah. Um, so we, we got to spend you know a lot of time with each other, and he, he kept saying, "I need your help here and there," and and got me in, and and uh, basically he's got a big property portfolio, so that was an attraction to learn um, from you know a big player yep. in the market, and yep. um, I guess the le- the lesson there is that you know that a deal is a deal, but the paperwork's the same, the negotiations are the same, the deals with the bank are the same, the paperwork's the same. Yeah. Um, it's all the same. And uh, it just comes down to the horsepower of being able to fund a deal, yeah. depending on how many zeros are in it, versus um, what other people can do. So it's, it's all the same process. You know, there's the same set of keys goes to the same same locksmith, you know, whether it's a yeah. $200,000 house or $200 million commercial property it's the same locksmith that does the job so yeah um it's all it's all just process you know um yeah. and so yeah learn, learn learn from him and 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 um i was just really i guess intrigued to to sit with him and learn from him his his mannerisms his techniques his um the way he negotiates what he doesn't say, most importantly, which is probably where I get myself in trouble a bit, talking too much. Um, <laughs> okay. um, yeah, yeah. So um, what, no, what, a, were the, a, what were the yeah. take-homes from that, mate? Then uh, you spent 12 months there. What were the, the big takeaways yeah. for you? Um, again, and again, you know, this is, a, this is a, a migrant family that had asked the Australian government three times to be citizens of the country. Yeah. You know, and... Um, here they are spending hundreds of millions of dollars 30 odd years later after being allowed to be citizens. So, yeah. um, again, anything is, anything is possible, you know, given the right attitude, given the right, um, application of discipline or knowledge, um, you know, it's, it's amazing. And, pro- and probably the biggest thing for me is their sense of family and unity that they have to, and loyalty to one another. It's inspiring, absolutely inspiring. Yeah, that's how right. they handle them. Australians have got a lot to learn, and they, they, they think generationally, don't they? Not not just in terms oh, of years, but generationally. Yeah, we we had those discussions about what 
the eighty year plan is. Yeah. You know? Yeah. When, when you're sitting with, with sitting with people talking about what their eighty year plan is when they're fifty years of age, you're like, hang on, is there something here I'm missing? What is <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll give it I'll give you I'll give you to a hundred. What happens after that? But, <laughs> Walt Disney's gonna be around, mate, he's frozen that perhaps uh, yeah, Fred's yeah. gonna do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, but you know it's amazing, and and uh, yeah, like that word legacy as well. Like what the what what those brothers do, the sons do to to honour their their father's decision making is um yeah, it's beautiful. It's yeah. absolutely beautiful. Awesome. Yeah, well, some great takeaways there. Which, which no doubt, you, I mean, you're married with some with some kids. Is that is that started to yep. influence the way you're approaching the future, mate? Yeah, yeah. I, well, I make decisions for my grandchildren. Yeah. And um, my daughter's eight, my son's four, but I'm making decisions for my grandchildren. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how. Because someone once said to me that they said, "Do you think you would have talked your grandfather out of buying a property on Sydney Harbour in 1940 for 20 grand?" <laughs> exactly. Exactly right. Yeah, it's a good analogy, mate. Mate. Uh, Isn't it? The uh, yeah. you you've also got some time now to put into some pretty groundbreaking stuff, and uh, you, you've had a bit of a roller coaster ride already uh, in the medical marijuana and the cannabis field. Yeah, uh, talk to us a bit about that because you know there's there's been some fairly high profile stuff, and you've had some interesting yep. partners on that journey. Uh, talk <laughs> us through uh, how that's gone and where that currently sits. Yeah. So this is probably three years in the making and when we started out it wasn't legal in South Australia or Australia and that's that's now changed. Yeah. Um, hemp wasn't legal in South Australia, that's now changed. Yeah. Um, what, what hasn't changed though is we've, we've still got some work to do around access and people getting access to, to cannabis. So my, my belief is that, you know, and, and, and science is dictating this belief is that when we went to school and people of my, my vintage, which is if you're born in the 80s or earlier, you you left school believing that cannabis was a gateway drug, it was the worst thing on the planet and only low life did it and <laughs> that sort of thing. And then you know, we Cheech and Chong the drive-in on a Saturday night. Yeah, 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 all that stoner movies and all that sort of culture <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is all based on on fiction. Yeah. Um, um, totally. So it, it's you, know, you delve into the story of how it became so so scorned in society and why it became so scorned in society and who those people are and why it was done and you start to think, hang on, there's something to this and so we we. I'm guessing it's probably to do with the drunk companies wanting to eliminate anything that's a, a natural source that would get in the way no, of no, no, flogging it's, some chemical. It's even, work, no, no, no. It's even more simplistic than that. It's basically you go back to to a guy by the name of Harry Anslinger in the 30s, who's an American. Yep. And he happened to be in charge of the department that looked after the prohibition of alcohol. Okay. And when that finished up, young Harry really didn't have much to do, so he went to this other stuff that this people with different skin colour to him seem to enjoy using <laughs> decided that was the evil thing and that's literally how it started. This guy decided that cannabis was bad and and had a position of influence and power to carry out that and that's where it all started. And then and then, you know, seventy, eighty years later we're still still believing that story without any facts attached to it. So yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the medi- the the scientific proof behind uh, the the medical benefits of of marijuana to uh, the elderly, cancer patients, a whole bunch of it's, you know you, you can't argue with it. It's it's it, it's there and, and proven. So how do you overcome yeah. the the mental shift though? Because we're, we're you know we've got a, a generation of politicians, and I, again, I think even in our recent sphere, uh, yep. there's open attacks on. On marijuana, almost winding back the clock. Uh, yeah. How? What's your thoughts on how that's going to be overcome, and and where do you see uh, the real opportunity? Because I, I mean, here we are in, in that good old Adelaide, the, the best kept secret in the country, uh, with yeah. an opportunity like this that could create a massive industry where manufacturing's you know falling over almost by the day. Uh, would yep. would appear to be a massive opportunity to me. Uh, 
where does it sit and, and how are you going to sort of over, overcome some of those political challenges to, to build an industry? Well, it comes down to dealing with the right people. And, and you know, had, had Labor got back in in South Australia, I think we'd be having a different discussion to what we are now. Yeah. Because um, they were going to be brave enough. I, we had the plan all set and locked and ready to go. And, and you know, when you're dealing direct with the decision makers, yeah. um, you know where that sits. So yeah. basically just had to restart that whole process. And, and you know, the, the reality is, is you, you, you are going to find those people that are stuck in, in the past, but there's a lot of people like, you know, you just said that you, you've read enough about it, you've seen enough about it to go, okay, this is no longer needs to be demonised. There's, there's something to be uncovered here. And the reality in South Australia and indeed Australia is the, the, the industry already exists, but where it exists is in the shadows. So it's actually yeah. profiteering the black market and enabling them to, to cash flow other things that, that are far more serious than what we're talking about. So every step of the way, there's there's good that comes out of it. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, it, and it just comes down to, to politicians being brave enough and they are, are out there. You know, you look at the Senator Di Natale and his, his stance and he's a drug of addiction specialist, I, I think. Yeah. He's certainly a medical doctor. So he can speak with authority on the, the medical side of things and, yeah. um, you know, the pill testing at festivals is, you know, a big thing at the moment and it just comes down to this attitude, you know, are, are we going to allow our kids to consume stuff illegally in the shadows yeah. or do it with some sort of guidance and perhaps save their life, you know, and, and where do we sit morally on that? So yeah. um, do we take the stance that it's illegal, therefore it's a bad, or is it, do we take the stance that, well, the law may be wrong? Yeah. Um, well, there's, there's enough instances around the, country, around, the, around the globe that would suge- suggest otherwise, and it's the old story. If we, yeah. uh, I think the... The challenge that Adelaide's always always had, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on this. And I, I, I love South Australia; it's a it's a fantastic place to live. Uh, but uh, we are we do tend to be conservative, and we do tend to talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, and talk about it. And by the time we finally make a decision, it's too late because someone else has done it. Um, yeah. Uh, what, what's your thinking around that, mate? And and how how do you see yourself then overcoming some of those challenges to uh, really? Uh, optimise the opportunity that uh, we can, that you're driving, is uh, um, sitting before. It's just persistence. You know, if you, if you stay true to your beliefs and your why, why am I doing this? I've got a really personal why about why I'm doing this. Yep. Um, it, it, that's that's all you need is to keep knocking on doors. And and it goes back to the things we talked about earlier. I've got, an, I, I've got no problem pulling a Premier aside and saying, oi, we need to talk about this. Here's the reality. When have you got ten minutes for me to go and chat about it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, it's sort of my upbringing. I guess I'm lucky to have that. Yeah, that I'm sort not of afraid. Fearless, limitless uh, approach to life, mate. Which uh, the, 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 there aren't many yeah. to do, mate. So I, I totally applaud that, buddy. Mate, um, yeah. M- moving forward, then. Uh, Yep. What, what, what's the future look like for you, mate? Is it it's a more property and then sort of dipping in the toe into to other opportunities like uh, uh, medical yeah. marijuana and cannabis? Uh, paint that picture for us. Yeah, so it's it's um, seeing the cannabis project through to fruition, which is um, I think you know this time next year. So come December twenty nineteen, I should that should well and truly be in place. Um, the building blocks are, are, are there and um, we should have something in train there. So that'll be a good experience. Um, and then just, I guess, we become more of a, uh, an asset manager role more than anything. Um, and then it just comes down to what interests you, you know, and what, where do you find appeal, whether it's widget making, whether it's donating, whether it's um, mentoring, whatever it is. Yeah, that's sort of what I see. Yeah, anything arising because it, it, you're, you're one of the the few that's uh, deliberately managed your your lifestyle to put you in a situation where you do have time in your hands because your income needs are being looked after by the assets yeah. that you've yeah. invested in. What, what are the interests that yep. are really grabbing your appetite at the moment, mate? 
Um, it really, it really is the cannabis because there's enough work yeah. there for an army of people. Yeah. And and sometimes you've got to be patient. Yeah. And sometimes you've got to know when to go over the hill. Um. Yeah. Sometimes you've got to know when to fire back, yeah. and that's that's probably yeah. where my my main focus is at the moment. But yeah. you know, we've got other. It's I don't know if it's the same with you. You know, a mate of mine's got a saying: the deal of a lifetime walks past your door every week. Yeah. And that, and it's been the discipline yeah. to say no to a lot of that stuff for the last few years because and stay focused because it's very easy to get unfocused. Yeah. And very easy to get distracted by the shiny glittery thing. Yeah, the the, the sort of deal make you in, in you where it constantly gets in the way because there's always a, a fantastic deal that's that's walking through the door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you go, oh, well, I can ring that guy and that guy and put that, that thing together and then set it off into wild and no, 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 go back to what you're supposed to be doing. Don't worry about that. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> mate, yeah. it's awesome, mate. Uh, let me just flick into what I call the ambush session, mate, uh, which is a, a yeah. couple of questions that uh, the audience loves to get your thoughts on. Uh, first of those is, what's your favourite quote and why, mate? Um, nothing is either good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. Yeah. And the reason why I love that is it's just, is what it is. Yeah. It's what our past experiences or our hopes or our perceptions or our attitude put into a situation that can make it really good or make it really crappy. So just being able to sit, think and say, okay, what, how do I respond to this bad news, good news, whatever it is, uh, move forward. Well, I mean, perfectly applicable given the uh, the cannabis industry that we're talking about because it's the old story. You know, social norms uh, can colour judgment and uh, because of that can miss massive opportunity just by reframing, hold on, this is not bad. Uh, let's let's yeah. let's let's question that and look at what the what the true merits are. No, that's awesome, mate. Yeah, quite, yeah, what, quite often it's just the story you tell yourself that attaches it, you know. Yeah, that the old perception thing, pe- perception's reality, yep. spot on, mate. Mate, uh, yep. most people I talk to who've in, enjoy su- sustainable success uh, tend to read. Uh, what, yep. What's the top book that you'd recommend and why? Uh, this is going to sound really boring, but it's not boring because it's still the most awesome book. I think anyone, if anyone means something to me, I'll buy them this book. It's Rich Dad Poor Dad. Yeah. I, I think that's where everything starts. Yeah. And it's such a beautiful book for so many ways that it just resonates and, you know, the success and the volume of sales dictates, you know, that, it, that it's – that's the book. In, in the topics we're discussing, that's yeah. the book. Yeah. Matt, I had my own Kiyosaki moment uh, a bit over 20 years ago. It was, a, it was an absolute light bulb moment to me, mate, to someone who'd um, – uh, come out of a, a pretty tricky divorce with absolutely zero and, and starting again. And it was wow. that, that book that uh, set me on our current course and now gives me the, the life that we enjoy. And yeah. uh, when I was listening to you and, and you were talking about, uh, you know, soaking it in up there in Hamilton Island, I was, I was thinking about the Rich Dad exercise right there, mate, where uh, you know, you've pretty yeah. much had a Rich Dad uh, poor mum Experience exactly. probably uh, in in your own life that's shaped what you now do and, yeah. and why you get to do what you do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like when I when I read that book, I was like, "This is me." <laughs> Holy hell! <laughs> Which is completely arrogant to say, but it kind of if that makes sense, you know. Like I'm not no, saying it an arrogant, but like I'm like, man, I've lived this. I get it. So yeah, yeah, it's part of my note. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Uh, what's what's the top thing you've done to pay less tax, mate? Because most Australians feel like we pay too much. Uh, in within the confines of legality, uh, what uh, is the top thing that you've done to minimise what you're contributing to the tax? Get the tax? right account. Yeah, yeah. Get the right account. Yeah. Nothing I've done personally. Yeah. I haven't come up with any. You know, it's all been education by people who know better. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, so you combine a good accountant with with property, and uh, there's no no better way to make sure that you're keeping most of your hard earned in your pocket, mate. That's for sure. Yeah, 
Yep. Awesome. Now, mate, yep. a bit more general. What's both the worst yep. and the best piece of investment advice that you've ever received? Ha. 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 There's the old line, if it flies, floats all, but we won't go there. Um, <laughs> the best. Compound interest. Yeah. And that was something my grandfather taught me. Yeah. And it just, like, he tried to explain. I just remember him sitting on his knee and him trying to explain it to me over and over again. I just did, just didn't make sense to me about how money just appeared out of nowhere. Yeah. And I think, so that's probably, whether it's compound interest or, you know, it's growth in your rent because you're getting more than CPI or your, your, you know, growth in your property portfolio or growth in your shares or growth in whatever it is. Yeah. That's all compounding interest to me. That's yeah. all just compounding. Yeah. Um, it's what uh, the Albert, worst. Albert Einstein referred to it as the eighth wonder of the world, mate. Would you believe? And I can see why. Yeah, it's exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the worst is, well, this is also probably the best. Don't don't get involved in professional sports teams. <laughs> <laughs> for financial reasons. For financial reasons. For yeah. warm and fuzzy, knock yourself out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good experience to have early though, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, well, look, mate, uh, just to close things off, because I know you're a busy man, uh, if you were to uh, perhaps speak to your son as he's just leaving school or, or, or a school leaver, what would mm. you advise them to invest their time, money and skills in to create freedom, mate? Well, for me, you know, I'd stick to what you know, and for me it's proper. Property. So to get into property as soon as possible, my 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 brother, who's eighteen years younger than me, bought his first property at eighteen. Yeah. Because that's when he was legally able to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's probably the answer. Yeah. Property. Yeah. Because it just it's never going to be cheaper. Yeah. The best best time was twenty years ago, and the second best time today. Yeah. Exactly yeah. right, mate. Exactly yeah. right. One hundred percent agree. Uh, okay, mate. Um, that. Pretty much brings us to a close. Uh, if anyone wants to pick your brains on any of these subjects, uh, you're open to them getting in touch with you, mate? Yeah, no problem. No problem. How would they, um, how would they do that? Probably Twitter, just at benefits is the best way. Yeah. Um, you'll have to wade through all the basketball ones and I thought, but that's okay. <laughs> Mate, uh, been a pleasure spending some time with you, Ben. Uh, lo- love your insights. Uh, keep keep doing your thing, mate. I I really hope that we can is a success. It's something that the globe Thank needs, you. but also Adelaide needs. So right behind you, yeah. everything you're doing there, mate. And if there's anything I can do to assist, then uh, please yell out. Cheers, Bushy. Appreciate it. Thanks, mate. Talk to you soon. Right. Cheers. Thanks, man. Well, freedom fighters, how good was that? get a summary of all this investment gold in the show notes, just email me on hello at khgroup.com.au. That's H-E-L-L-O at khgroup.com.au. Or check us out at www.bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. I look forward to joining you next week for another episode of the Get Invested podcast. So thanks for listening. And as always, dream as if you live forever and live as if you'll die.